Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce Tanya Berger-Wolf. Um, Tanya Berger-Wolf is maybe what I, who, someone I think of as like one of the first people to really try to live at this intersection between computer science and ecology. Um, she has been an amazing mentor to me and has really been a leader in this field for quite a long time. Um, and uh, I think probably all of you through Jason have some familiarity now with uh, Wild Book. Um, Tanya was one of the PIs that did the original investigation into animal re-identification, specifically the zebra. Um, and she's also done a lot of really cool um, sort of quantitative and computational work around uh, social behaviors of animals. And today I think she's mostly talking about her new very large scale um, uh, institute around uh, what's, what's being called imageomics, essentially trying to look at uh, this very large cadre of data that we're collecting across all of these different modalities. So acoustics, images, text, um, movement ecology, um, and thinking about ways to use things like computer vision to start probing that massive repository of data for new ecological information and understanding new things about science. So Tanya, please let me know if I butchered that. Um, but please take it away. No, thank you. And uh, I am thrilled to see all of you guys all in one um, tile of my Zoom. But uh, because of this, and I wish I was there with you in person, and uh, this looks very exciting, and I hope that in the future I will. And as you all know, once I put the presentation mode on for, for, for my talk, it's very hard for me to see raised hands or just yell out the questions and Sarah, please. Um, this is uh, I'm reasonably in interactive. I'm hoping to make it a reasonably interactive talk. I mean, in person, it would be fully interactive. But um, and I, it's also a little bit of a choose your own adventure. So if some questions start popping up in a particular direction, I am happy to take the talk in that direction. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and uh, um, try and, and, and I will try not to ignore you guys from this. Um, I also need to make sure that uh, the computer uh, audio comes through um, da, 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 and it's now I forget how to do it again. Why does it not let me do this? Um, hmm. No. Never mind. Oh, there we go. Um, the share computer sound and present. So, with us, uh, part of this, uh, part of the conversation today, and sort of uh, what I'm uh, going to talk is is really going back to this connection between why use. I mean, all of you are using computer vision for ecology, I, I want to, to step back for a little bit and say, what is the promise? Why, why in the first place use computer vision for ecology in, and, and what can we do, what more can we do? Sort of from more from the ecological perspective with the, uh, uh, with the computation, with the uh, quantitative as the means to an end. So, you know, and if we're talking about this scientific and ecological perspective, then uh, going back to Poincaré, um, who kind of laid the foundation for what we call the scientific method today, and the beautiful book, if you haven't read it, I highly encourage you to read this, Science and Method. My favorite quote, quote there is uh, this, uh, at the, um, both at the beginning and at the end. So this is from the end of the book. The scientific method consists in observation experiment. Okay, yeah, we all know that, but if the scientist had an, a, an infinity of time at his disposal, it would be sufficient to say to him, look and look carefully. But since he has not time to look at everything and above all to look carefully, and, and this is what I tell all my students, since it is better not to look at all than to look carelessly, he's forced to make a selection. And the first question then is to know how to make this selection. And so I would argue that all that, you know, computational approaches do is to help us to look, to help scientists really look more carefully at more things. So, you know, scientists have looked at the natural world, biologists have looked at the natural world for 
uh, centuries, you know, and and understanding and, and recording what they saw and making and getting insight from what they saw. And we're increasingly looking with more and more sophisticated tools and recording what we're seeing with more, in, with more sophisticated devices, allowing us hopefully to make more sophisticated insight. And just like the microscope, the telescope and the, you know, the satellites, you know, the tools that we're using today allow us to span our ability to look at the world from the from the microscopic, literally, you know, to to the the planetary scale and record this. And so, you know, with this ability to look at more things more carefully, we're starting to ask questions that uh, uh, about the, the the natural world at, at increasingly different scales and connecting. You know, and all of this is looking with our eyes and then came genomics and what genomics did um, is really provided tools to look at things we couldn't in principle look at, right? Uh, to provide, uh, to, to, for which we had no hardware and allow us to start connecting phenotype to genotype. Uh, we started talking for the first time about this connection between phenotype and genotype in really quantitative and, and massive ways, uh, whether it's about the GWAS, right, the, 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 the uh, genome-wide association, uh, which directly connects uh, phenotype to genotype or the, uh, you know, the evolutionary connections of, of comparative genomics, which suggest evolutionary hypothesis. Uh, or more recently, even to able to, to, to alter the phenotype by changing the genotype with, the, uh, with CRISPR and other tools. So great. And we've kind of switched to, to, to looking at a lot of the things from the genomics perspective, um, you know, whether it's making the, the, the species classification and determination, uh, or um, the, 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 the sort of newer evolutionary hypothesis, they, they, they became very genotype focused. But we have increasingly ability to come back to phenotype through a variety of tools, right? So we have a, a vast number of different sensors, whether it's satellite, uh, drones, or on-body animal sensors, um, acoustic sensors, and all of you, I'm sure, are using a good subset of those. And so they they really allow us to look at the uh, to look at the world and look at more things. The question is, are they allowing us to look more carefully? And so notice one of the things, and probably the reason you're there today is uh, is this uh, that many of these sensors, many uh, of the data types here are actually image data types, right? They are uh, the most abundant images are the most abundant readily available source of information today about anything and particularly about the natural world. And these images coming from, you know, all of these camera traps, drones, satellite images, uh, even citizen science observations, but also digitized natural history museum collections. That's the big National Science Foundation effort, I dig bio. Um, bring in millions of specimen, specimens um, to, uh, to digitize millions of specimens. So, so there are millions and probably billions soon to be images, probably billions of images out there. I mean, just to put a little bit of scale, iNaturalist, which is, if you're not familiar, this is a citizen science platform uh, for reporting na uh, nature observations. iNaturalist alone has uh, more than 100 million observations right now, right? Spread out all over the world with some interesting kind of uh, holes, which in and of itself is interesting. Um, but 100 million observations, it's a vast one source, right? Vast source of information. And so we're, and you're learning about these tools, um, of making sense of, of all these images. So this is our ability to look at things more carefully, right? We have tools now for 
detection and localization um, of uh, objects in an image, individual identification, which Jason uh, led the development here and, and can talk a lot more about it. I will talk a little bit, you know, posture estimation, uh, environmental reconstruction, and much, 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 much more. So, so uh, you know, this complements our own hardware that allows us to look at, you know, not only to look at more things, but to look at them more carefully. So particularly, you know, because we're not that great to look uh, at looking at many, many, many things and extracting useful information quickly out of it. So, you know, can you find all the zebras in these images? <clears throat> Three seconds, come on. <laughs> right, so, uh, so so this is where uh, computer vision approaches and the entire stack of them comes in. And the, this is uh, Wildbook, which is now in the process of being renaming, renamed. So Wildbook is a platform, a project of the nonprofit WildMe. Um, Jason is their lead engineer. The platform allows us, so the entire stack allows to take all these millions of images from all these different sources and not only find all the ones that contain animals and put a bounding box around each one and you probably now in your head already know, oh, I know how to do that, I know how to do that. Um, but also in identify not only species, not only to do the species classification, uh, but identify down to individual animals. So not only gravy zebra or zebra, but Zip of the zebra and uh, Joe the giraffe and Terry the turtle and Willie the whale. So anything striped. That's an amazing amount of photos. I wonder, how do they sort through them all and then identify individual animals? Each image is processed through a series of convolutional neural networks and matching algorithms. The first network determines whether there are any animals of interest. In this case, zebras. The next set of networks localize each animal in its own subregion and classify the species. At this point, background segmentation is performed on the subregion to generate a rough mask of the zebra. Once this is done, key points are extracted from the zebra and feature descriptors are built. These descriptors serve as a sort of fingerprint that can be compared for similarity against previously identified individual animals in a large database. The scores from this comparison allow the system to decide which animals are the most likely matches. When the match has high enough confidence, it's accepted immediately. Matches that have lower confidence are shown to a human expert who then makes the final decision. And I mean, it's a challenging computer. This is a very, very high level of review um, and of, of the process. It's a challenging computer vision problem, right? So here's the interactive part. This is the quiz part. How many zebras are in this top left picture? So uh, we're going to vote. Raise your hand if you see three. Do I see any hands there? Yeah, I see hands there. OK. How about four? How about five? No five? OK. Um, so we can count legs, right? How many legs do zebras have? <laughs> All right, for for as like as a non-biologist, I, I hope I'm correct here. So we can count <laughs> right the one, two, three, four. That's one zebra. There's the one, two. Can you see my pointer by the way? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have the one, two, three, four. That's two zebras. There are extra legs still left. There must be another zebra. Three, and then there is a photo bomb, right? There's a head. So there is at least four zebras. So it's 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 hard not only, you know, it's hard for humans. So <laughs> certainly in this case, you know, it's 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 a kind of thing that if it's hard for humans, it's hard for a computer. Not a, not all the problems are like this. Um there is also a viewpoint. Zebras turns out are not symmetric on the left and on the right. They're also, you know, certainly the bottom and top views are different. Um, there is the quality, lighting, occlusion, blur, resolution, all of this kinds of fun things. And then there is the scarring and aging. So this is the same zebra as a fall and as an adult pregnant female. Um, mm -hmm. 
and and this is biology right <laughs> some some features change some don't as the uh, animal matures and um, uh, goes through different demographic stages and so this is more questions towards jason for this one so the whole pipeline right goes from the image to basic uh, species classification mm -hmm. putting bounding box or annotation localization then um the the viewpoint classification and quality background segmentation and then the extra interesting stuff uh, step is identifying annotation mm -hmm. of interest so this is um because if you one so not all not all of these are individually identifiable and likely to be identifi individually identifiable and if you start doing this and this is a typical problem in computer vision if you you know garbage in garbage out and you're going to to one skew your algorithms and skew your outcomes by literally sending uh, uh, very very noisy data into it and so with that uh, the the approach then one of the approaches for individual uh, identification is using what's known as SIF. It, it's scale and variable feature transform, which is using um, a vector that encodes the gradient of the change to the succession Hessian transform. So you slide, you compute the local gradient around each pixel of the values of, of the changes in the pixel values. And you know, the more change, the higher the gradient. You want to take the top sort of um, the hot spots where the, this change is very high and encode it in a way which allows you to quickly compare it to images. And so that's what uh, scale invariant feature transform essentially does as an approach. It encodes these sort of the entire. Um, information in the entire image as a, as a vector that you can then use to compare between two images and match the areas of high uh, gradient uh, of the pixel value change. So that's one of the approaches and that the nice part is because it's a local computation it allows you to ch to to um, it, it and because we do segmentation background segmentation it allows you to uh, match uh, regardless if with different backgrounds with different lightings right and different positions different angles even viewpoints um, <coughs> it, it matches what's matchable uh, you know pre slight distortion due to pregnancy in this case uh, doesn't throw off these algorithms much so, and we can do it for anything stripes, spotted, wrinkled, notched. So this is one of the seven currently, and I think Jason can correct me, I think eight now algorithms used in the in in wild book. And you know, this th that one is the first one uh, using really the pixel, the, the variability in the pixel values. And um, you can the, the, for some species. We use the shape of a whale's fluke or the dorsal fin of a dolphin with a slightly different approach, but it's still, it's not a machine, I want to point out, it's not a machine learning approach. It's a straight up computer vision. Uh, there are some of these are machine learning approaches, more recent ones. And so then once you can identify, so, so okay, great, we can identify beautiful uh, piece of algebra, a uh, couple of computer vision publications, so what? So then once you can identify an individual, you can look at more things more carefully because uh, with the information on when and where the image was taken, right? And you can now track an individual, count them, you can do their social network, you can do population dynamics and ranges uh, because it allows you, uh, allows access to, to uh, reliable re-identification over time. So this is a, an example of a page from a wild book for citations. And that's Pinchy. She is the most cited individual in, in that wild book. So she's a sperm whale. And you can see sort of the kind of information um, that uh, is available in wild book. And some of you already have seen this. Uh, so wild book today, this is slightly, this is I think a week old numbers, but it has more than uh, 300,000 sightings of almost 70,000 uniquely identified whales and dolphins. So that allows you to really start, start uh, uh, 
sort of understanding patterns, global patterns at scale. We also, um, well, Wild Me also built a bot that can scrape social media and add um, these pa uh, the images and videos that are uh, posted passively without the intent of being used for uh, science and conservation. And the nice part about it is that you can take these images, videos and, and photos, right? Run them through the same process of ident individual identification and then add them, added information to the appropriate wild book, in this case, whale sharks. And then, so the bot posts, generates text, posting back in the comments, hey, two minutes, 46 seconds uh, in this video, you can see this whale shark. Here's everything we know about it. An amazing thing that people respond, right? They didn't even think by taking this vacation video in uh, Cancun that uh, they would be contributing to science and conservation and meeting people. So what AI allows us to do, right? These computation approaches, not only to, to get access to this data, but to engage people in the process um, and, and, and kind of give them agency of participating in science and conservation. Because the most common response that we have in these comments is like, wow, this is amazing. How can I help, right? So it's connecting people to directly through their photos, through their uh, videos to the scientific process, to conservation process, meeting them where they are. And the other part is that at the bottom of a page here, you can see these are all the um, individuals and organizations that can have contributed data to this specific whale shark individual. So, because these are global species, so there is not one, uh, not one organization, not one research project that has information even about one individual. It's by putting p uh, these pieces of data together that we can really build a global picture of a species. And so what computational approaches, what computer vision in this case allows is to really connect among different pieces of data and different research researchers that uh, that that hold that data and incentivize that sharing in and what it gives, other than you know this statistics that uh, now there are seventeen thousand uniquely identified sharks and more than thirteen thousand of those are whale sharks, uh, and more than sixty species of uh, that the, the we have platforms well book platforms for more than 60 species but the impact of it is that for whale sharks the um the 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 iucn red list information for the global population now is from data uh, from from the shark book from the wild book data it used to be called whalesharkorg it's now sharkbook.ai and the previously the global population size was estimated to be 103,000 with a standard error between 27,000 and 180,000. So that's a very scientific way of saying we have no clue. <laughs> right? With wild of data, with the ability to identify individuals and expanding the sources of data and sort of getting more data and looking at it more carefully, global not only global population size has been reassessed, but also the, the conservation status of the species has been changed from vulnerable to endangered, and the population trend from stable to decreasing. Not because the species are doing worse, but because we have better data to make that determination, right? And the most comprehensive study on the biology of whale sharks was done using data from Wild Book and uh, co-authored by 37 authors who met through the pages of Wild Book. So this is at the bottom. These are these connections that are at the bottom of each page. You know, people who, are, who have contributed uh, data to, to, to this individual. And so making connections among all these disparate pieces of data allowed to understand, for example, migration patterns, seasonality of migration patterns. And even more recently, there is a new paper, again, co-authored by many authors who, who, who met through the, some of whom met through the pages of Wild Book, right? So, so, so it allows this re-identification, allows us to connect among pieces of data and allows us to connect, allows us to connect among 
different scientists in the project looking at the same data, like looking at the same species to really understand the, 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 the biology of the species. Um, great. So are we done? Not quite, right? Because the goal initially was that, like at least the stated goal of this talk is to connect phenotype to genotype. There is nothing in what I described so far, despite the impressive kind of outcomes of, of understanding biology of an entire species or helping conservation, which by the way, other than whale sharks, there's three more species, two more species actually that, that uh, uh, IUCN Redlist directly uses data from Wild Book and many other studies that, uh, uh, many other studies that, that indirectly use uh, data. And one of the, big impacts also is that uh, one of the, the data deficient species of which there are 18,000, in the and Red List, there are 18,000 data deficient species, meaning their conservation status is data deficient. I take it as a personal challenge as a data scientist and computer scientist, you know, how can we have conservation status being data deficient? And these are not obscure species. Well, uh, killer whales, orcas are data deficient. So killer whales are one of the uh, most recent additions to fluke book. So hopefully we'll be data deficient no more by then, you know, very soon. But it's still, all of this does not connect phenotype to genotype. So where do we go from here and how do we do this? So all of your ecologists, so probably don't need this um, refresher, but you know, traits as in characteristics of, this, of an organism, everything from physiology and morphology to life history, behavior and so on, um, and the product of genes and environment and the interactions among them. And uh, the problem is with this, uh, that traits are not currently computable. You cannot directly extract traits from data with any quantitative computational quantitative approaches. Right. And so this is where imageomics come in, comes in. We introduce, <coughs> we think of imageomics as an, it is a new field of science, which makes traits computable from images. So image from images to biological traits using quantitative approaches, just like genomics is from sequences to biological uh, traits using quantitative approaches. And this, you know, more broadly is really the, the imageomics is about extracting phenotype from images, both photo, uh, photos and videos directly. So how can we do this, right? Um, and the approach that we're initially taking, and this is really just the initial first steps, because the, the you know, as genomics that started with the Human Genome Project, Human Genome Project was about sequencing the human genome. What genomics is today is, 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 is way beyond sequencing a particular genome, right? But you have to start somewhere. So we're starting with the approach of leveraging biological information, structural biological information, to constrain the machine learning models so that the, the, the outcome of these models, particularly image focused machine learning models, it is interpretable, ideally explainable. So we want to go beyond the, the, the this is you know, species, uh, uh, beyond species classification, but be able to say this is this species because here are the traits that separate uh, these two species. And not only maybe traits that humans already have uh, been using to, to classify, to, 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 to get the taxonomy, but the real hope is that computers are helping us see something that we're not seeing currently, right? To allowing us to look at more things more carefully and perhaps seeing something that we're not seeing yet. The promises to, to, to discover traits, you know, to suggest hypotheses. And so as, as an example here, you can do species classification the standard way, 
but the uh, the key idea is that that species that share the taxonomic concepts, for example, common genomes, um, have similar traits, and that that and this is a hope, right? This is a hypothesis that that those will uh, ex be expressed as similar features at the neural network layers, right? And so the goal is to bridge this hierarchy of deep learning features with a known hierarchy in biology, for example, phylogeny. And, uh, <coughs> you know, the, the, the first path, has, uh, the first approach of doing species classification with and without phylogenetic information, and not only it improves the species classification, adding the structure, sort of the hierarchical structure of phylogenies, but it also, you can look at the saliency maps of the resulting, um, uh, the resulting classification, you know, and start figuring out uh, perhaps which features are salient for different species classification and maybe going from this features to traits. Uh, watch the spot. We're still in the process. And so why would there be hope at all uh, that, or, or like even thinking that computers may be seeing something that humans are not? Uh, we already have evidence of this, right? We're, 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 our eyes are not, certainly not perfect. And that's why we're using microphones, and, uh, microphones, <laughs> microscopes and telescopes. Uh, but, but even sort of looking at the scale at the normal organismal scale, our spectral range is not perfect. Um, and, and there's now starting to be evidence that machine learning can, uh, can do species classification reliably for species where humans do not see the differences. So yes, uh, there is a signal and uh, the hope is to translate that signal into something that is semantically meaning, biologically meaningful right, ideally as a biological trait. And so for butterflies, another one of the uh, image, another imageomics project uh, as an example of sort of what do we mean is looking at uh, malaria and mimicry. So this is a classic example of mimicry in biology where you have two species of butterflies, in this case, Heliconius butterflies, errata and malpomene. So on the left, so the first, third, and fifth column, those are Heliconius errata, and the second, third, uh, second, fourth, and sixth, so the even columns are Milpomenes, uh, Heliconius Milpomenes. And the certainly, you know, the, 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 the all the uh, erratas are more related to each other than they are to any Milpomene and vice versa. But visually, Milpomene is, uh, is mimicking errato to gain the, 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 the same level of uh, protection from birds because from predators, which are, happen to be birds, because errato uh, figured out, uh, evolved to have to signal to the birds, you know, I'm poisonous, don't eat me. Um, and then Milpomene by mimicking the parents happens to signal the same thing to the bird and gain the same level of protection with half the genome, right? So the genomic mechanism is different. The phenotype is similar, at least similar enough for birds not to, uh, not to touch it. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, what is it, right? What is the, 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 the part of the phenotype that is similar to confuse the birds from bird's eye perspective versus sufficiently different so that the conspecific, right? That the females when they're mating can, can actually have no trouble telling apart, right? So you have, you wanna be similar, but not similar, but not too similar so that you don't, uh, you don't waste your, your genes on the hybrids. And, uh, you know, then again, the first question, is there a signal? Can we answer this question at all? With the, can we discover this difference and similarities uh, using using machine learning? And the answer is yes. 
uh, we looked at uh, species classification under very, very different regimes uh, using specifically using triple lo triplet loss. So meaning, so this is a uh, neural network architecture where you give, you give uh, three examples in training, two that you would consider the same and one which is different. And so the outcome embedding then uh, drives to, to put whatever the examples that are the same close to each other in the embedded space and the, uh, the, the different, the example that was provided is different uh, as, as far away in the embedded space, right? To find an embedding that, that has these uh, properties. And so, so you can play then what you can, with what you consider similar or different and, and, and asking in, in figuring out where there is a signal and how much of a signal there is. So uh, the two outcomes and sort of these these uh, these the, this charts the, the the graphs are in the just straight up let's do classification uh, species classification where we show this triplet loss the 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 when you know the same species as as the same examples and the anything you know doesn't matter what as the as the different example uh, so this is where the in the embedding the distance of a pair from the same species versus a pair that is from different species but are not co-mimics and in the middle is a distance between a pair from different species that are mimics right so this in and of itself essentially says, yes, there is a signal, right? The co-mimics are closer to each other than the non-mimic pairs. Moreover, if you just train the species classification purely, let's say on a rado, without ever showing a um, Milpomene example, and then ask it to classify a Milpomene it will correctly, with very incredible accuracy, classify it as the uh, as the as its paired mimic species subspecies. And so you can so so what it tells you is yes, there is a signal. Now we can ask what is that signal, right? And we're using um, in the embedded space and swing transformers to to which is a particular architecture of a deep neural network architecture uh, to, to not only uh, do the classification, but also uh, look at the, um, at, the, at the path in the embedded space between uh, two species. So this is Malpamine, on the left is Malpamine to Arado and on the right is Arado to Malpamine. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so the visualization here is the uh, the the, the uh, features that are changing in this transformation. So we can start asking question: What is it that's different? What's preserved, and what's uh, and what's uh, and, and what changes? Right. So again, these are just sort of the beginnings of this of this uh, journey of sort of extracting phenotype, phenotypic information from images and extracting biological traits from images. And so back to, to this question, to, to, to what can we do with the ability to identify individuals? I mean, it's great, we can do a lot of conservation and, and understand uh, population dynamics and, and, and other things. But uh, one of the things that people, one of the questions, particularly kids, keep asking us when I say we can identify individual zebras is are baby zebra stripes similar to its mom's right or to put it in biological terms can we extract Mendelian other any uh, Mendelian traits in uh, body patterns of animals or zebra stripes specifically right are they heritable and so you know you can as humans we have pretty good uh, ability to 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 quantify face face similarity facial similarity right this is how we identify uh, how we identify uh, kin this is uh, 
uh, we find uh, we find faces that are more similar to others uh, to ours as more uh, trustworthy. We uh, you know play the game of who the baby looks like, and 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 um, but we have no ability to quantify similarity of zebra stripes. I mean, if I ask you, are the top pair, you know, are they more or less similar to each other than the bottom pair? Mm -hmm. I don't know, <laughs> right? We have no hardware, no infrastructure to be able to do this. Actually, we have the, 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 we have the hardware, we are able to see the patterns. We just have no middleware, what's known as in computer systems, to, 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 to extract information and to quantify this. But computers can't. Right. This is we've, we've we've just showed that we can not only point out the similarity, but uh, compute the similarity, but we can actually point where the similarity is there. Right. What is similar between the two um, between the two individuals? And so, working with uh, uh, biologists who are studying. Uh, so this is a data set of Indian leopards that has uh, that has the the, the mother cub uh, relationships and photographs we so we have a, a ton of negative results so and mostly it's because of the data quality actually but there's some tantalizing uh, tantalizing positive results that are maybe suggesting something um, that for mother cup similarity, all the similarity we're finding are actually in the face, which is interesting and not yet in any way publishable. It's the, but uh, part of it is data quality. The other part is we're probably not using the right, uh, the right uh method computational method so who was that that's doing bare id from face facial bare id it's me Melanie. yeah yeah so yeah. so it would be interesting to to do facial um uh, we think that actually using directly uh, facial id on on cats like leopards uh and primates uh, could be the way to go for this but you know, this is suggesting that maybe face is the place to look. For zebras, we're doing we're studying a full study in collaboration with Dan Rubinstein. Uh, we're not only relying on mother-child uh, relationships, but having full genetics uh, from from dung from feces uh, of the entire population, including paternity and uh, and uh, maternity, and uh, and and so then having full uh, both parents and the genetics so that then we can start asking is there any similarity between the coat uh, of the zebra and the and, and the genetics but uh, where there may or may not be for zebra stripes and leopard spots there's certainly species where kin selection is based on visual patterns and that's eggs and birds and so that's kind of a related project with the same computational approach, but on a very different data set. The ability to identify individual patterns and compare individual patterns in eggs, in this case, will allow us to understand kin selection by birds and sort of delineate uh, what do they consider similar or different and the mechanisms of kin selection. And so back to this sort of having these millions of images and extracting information out of there, out of them, the, the, the promise of imageomics is not only to be able to say, oh, this is, you know, this species, but this is this species because, because it has a yellow belly and the, and, and the, the, the blue breast or like, uh, and, and, and maybe even see things that are, that, that we haven't run on any field guides or uh, taxonomic keys as diagrams. And so sort of going from stationary images to moving ones, one of the projects also is about identifying 
behavior from videos, behavioral traits, right? So going from, from videos to these ethograms, which are, <laughs> my brain hurts every time I look at it, mm -hmm. um, through pose estimation. And so I just came from Kenya um, and Hungary, uh, Przewalski Horse Preserve, uh, <coughs> where in collaboration with uh, Amr Ahmed from Stuttgart University and Max Planck Institute, uh, flying drones to get high resolution, high accuracy pose estimation, zebras in this case, to uh, and then go back uh, from that to go to behavior, behavioral traits. So this is kind of just examples of, of what we think is possible. And I'm hoping that our imagination is still too limited, that we will that a lot more will be possible of extracting phenotype, I mean, and, and, and biological traits from images uh, using computer vision and machine learning. And I would I want to thank the team of Wild Me and the Imageomics team and my ever-growing network of collaborators mm -hmm. and all the funders and uh, supporters that make my uh, curiosity possible. Thank you, guys. I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, I see a question there. Um, thanks, Tanya. That was really interesting. I've got like a million questions I could ask you. Um, but I was specifically interested in the like the wild me individual identification. And I was wondering how, um, say, for example, with the zebras, do you start with like an initial training set of labeled individuals? And then how does it deal with new individuals coming in? Fantastic question. And I could uh, mm -hmm. give it off to um, pass it on to Jason. But it's not, um, it's not a machine learning problem. So you don't need training data. Uh, and and uh, it's it's a computer vision approach, so it computes a function directly on every given image, right? So you don't need to train it. Uh, given an image, it will compute this vector of hotspots of pixel value changes. The thing, though, is uh, what you're asking is how does it deal with new individuals? It's a great question because. Uh, majority of individuals have one or two images. Actually, it's a super high, super skewed distribution. And so I'm actually going to share again um, with this individual ID. The common problem is that um, new individuals are continuously added to the system. I mean, in, in both biologically, I mean, they're either coming into the system, being born, right? So, um, and on the computational side, the data side, it is a heavily skewed distribution of sightings. So as I mentioned, majority of individuals have one or two pictures, and this is species after species. So majority of the queries, when we're asking who is this, it's not a matching problem to an existing data set. It's, a, it's, a, the, the, the hard, it's an open set problem. It's an open world problem. Uh, of, of the of kind of the worst kind where majority of the answers are, oh, this is a new one. Hmm. So how do you do this uh, reliably, right? Um, and there are other problems. I mean, humans uh, need to be part of the curation because you shouldn't and you can't trust the, uh, and, 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 you know, he, humans are also not great. If I give you a picture and ask you which one of those 30, Three, you know, of, of this 3,000 uh, individuals is this one. Humans cannot do this, but humans are good at, if I tell, give you two pictures of animals uh, and say, so is it the same one or not? That we can answer. But we also very rarely have uh, uh, metadata in, in, sort of in, in, in the settings. And of course, mistakes are inevitable. And so uh, the, 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 the approach that we're taking and uh, is, is to pose it, and Jason is leading, is to pose it as the, uh, the, the, the problem of continual curation, right? So we want to continuously maintain the ideas of the animals and the images, allowing for human decisions 
and allowing for for uh, error correction as more information, even on previous data, as more information comes in. And so, to allow for this, there is a uh, we're building, or rather, uh, Jason and uh, Chuck Stewart are building this data structure, which is a graph network data structure that for various very rigorous mathematical reasons uh, minimizes both the error of, uh, of making mistakes of whether it's the same animal or not in the <coughs> image and allows for uh, human for uh, allows better support for human curation, providing to humans the information that humans can actually uh, give good, good, uh, make good decisions as in, is it the same animal or not? Jason, you want to add anything to this? Um, yes. Um, Tanya, you did a great job just over giving the general overview. Um, what I would do from a technical standpoint is identify the root causes of why we believe that this problem is tractable. So when you have two images of zebra, you can look at them side by side and say pretty confidently and reliably and accurately that they are the same animal or not. So that's the foundational truth of doing matching for ID is whether or not you can do this verification task. Um, so if you were starting from scratch, you could take a new image with a small database and just look at every single pair, new image against every single, let's say you had 100 images. That's 100 decisions. If all of them came back no, then you know that that individual is new, right? The problem is, is as your database grows, you can't look at every single pair. You simply can't. There's not enough time to do it, and it's exponential growth. So you need to have some ability to look at the most likely things that could be true. And you have the assumption is that if you don't see it after reviewing a certain number of images, then it's very likely that it's a new individual. So as long as you have an algorithm that can search in the database with high recall, meaning after 20 or 10, whatever the number is, you are returning correct results 90% of the time, 95% of the time, you can make a probabilistic argument that if you've gone through that set of prioritized reviews and you still haven't found a match, then it's very likely to be a true a new animal that in of itself can be automated the pairwise decisions can be automated so as you build your database as you are slowly building the number of ids you are also adding pair decisions that you can train an algorithm to automate as well so there is a bootstrapping procedure there where you are accepting small amount of error into your database maybe there are some animals that need to be merged together or an animal needs to be split apart into two ids in your catalog but as you grow and as your automation improves, you can actually start bootstrapping the ML as you go, and then using the ML to curate the database that you're building and looking proactively for errors. And there's literally an entire PhD worth of material on that problem. <laughs> I kind of have a follow-up question to that, which is, um, could you use this method on a data set of multiple species and just say, like, because you're using it to look at two individuals of the same species the same. Can you say, like, this is one species? Is this is this picture the same species as the last one, or is it a new species? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> yes, you could. And part of it is using the same logic, uh, particularly for species where it's very, very hard to differentiate. Right, so uh, that uh, what I showed as the species classification project of imageomics, that's minnows. There are about 200 something species of minnows that it's actually hard to, for humans to differentiate. And so you could use the same, uh, the, the computer vision aspect of determining whether the same, not same, it would be different. So uh, uh, that method is different, but the, the data structure you can be very, very similar. And in fact, we're playing around with this. And Jason, you want to add more? No, you got it. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I thought it was really interesting that you talked about traits and predicting traits instead of just going for uh, just 
like species as the prediction target, which I think is, you know, kind of the norm. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts on like trying to go from individual traits on like an individual plant or animal and like thinking about that more at the ecosystem scale at like, mm -hmm. you know, the function of those traits situated like in context in like the actual natural world and like what you see as the open questions or prerequisites to get to a place like that. Great question. Yeah. So we have a couple, I mean, one is the, the, with the butterflies. So, you know, there's a great, if you, if you're familiar or if you want to look, there's a great, uh, by, by geography kind of gradient of, of, of appearance change of these heliconus butterflies because they're all over like South America, right? So, so, um, so one of the things that, that ecologists are really interested in looking at in this context and using computer vision to help look, first of all, we're now, and, and there's a group, PhD student who's spending his summer in Florida um, museum uh, uh, photographing these butterflies, both dorsal and ventral, and you doing it both in um, RGB light and UV light, because, because RGB is probably not meaningful, right, from, from Bert's perspective. And the other part is also, so, so when we're, we, we figure out, I mean, which traits, for example, make it look similar to, to bird, through bird's eye, literally <laughs> through bird's eye, it's, it's about, it's, it, it's probably, it should be probably in the, in the UV light. But the other part, it may not be about the actual appearance, it's about the movement right of those orange spots so they're also we're filming in super uh high resolution motion of uh, the, as these butterflies fly in this um uh, uh the, in in the in the column in the air column of of the pattern recording the pattern of this uh, orange spot and seeing you know what maybe it's about the pattern of the flight uh, that's meaningful to birds, not the actual appearance. So that's one side. But then the other part is also correlating then these uh, the, the 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 traits, because you know there's a huge variation as you as you may have noticed in the appearance of these butterflies, and and that variation is 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 uh, habitat dependent. So can we also uh, look at the traits that we're extracting and uh, here and and uh, uh, sort of look at the, the habitat characteristics of and the gradients of you know how much shade or light rather there is because uh, they, they vary from tropical forests to, to pretty open habitats and so um, seeing whether whether there is a function for some of these traits because they have to balance right this orange spots versus the amount of the amount of uh black uh for for uh, depending on the, the the availability of light and so that's very kind of quick example the other one is more complicated is a project we're looking at 3d um, 3D structure and shape of bat skulls for um, sorry uh, across uh, so to, to understand species speci the speciation pro process and species delineation um, so to here the hope is um, the hope is to discover, you know, to put it in like dumb non-biologist terms, you know, if we if we're looking at this sort of gradient or entire range of uh, let's say bats calls and different uh, across a range of uh, habitats, find that uh, there is a bump that's more prominent in one versus the other type of habitat. You know, this would suggest a hypothesis that it's meaningful. Uh, that it has some functionality, perhaps, or evolutionary, or maybe just an evolutionary artifact. Um, similarly with fish, 
the 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 which I said is minnows. Some of the um, saliency maps that are pointing in a, a particular region that again I have I know nothing about the biology of fish, but um, biologists are telling us that it could they're starting to notice patterns perhaps that that vary with the salinity of the water. Not salinity. I'm thinking about some. Sorry, these are not with the uh, the rate of flow in the water, right? So, so this could this is the beginning, and the hope is that 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 that's exactly the kinds of things that will come out of it. That we have it. That we will find traits that then can be correlated with either. Uh, environment uh, environment or ecological uh, so uh, evolutionary context because nothing in biology makes sense except in the context of environment and evolution to to really understand the function of these traits and really connect you know the the, the, the functional uh, phenotype and and especially if we can also connect it to genotype okay one more question and then, and then we're gonna wrap up. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Tanya. Um, I just wanted to loop back to what you were saying about face similarities in closely related leopards. Um, we've found something similar for grizzlies. So we have some mm -hmm. genetic info um, about this population that we study. And when we've run some CNNs, we found that those more closely related individuals have been confused more often. So I'm just wondering, kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of like worried about that in my development with the camera trap images of confusing these closely related individuals more often. And I just wonder, is there like, do you think there's any opportunities to kind of like build that information back into these models to be like these, you know, to make the models aware that these individuals may look more similar because they are closely related? So first of all, wow. Awesome. Amazing. <laughs> Let's talk. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I mean, if if you're getting that signal, uh, then uh, that then so so there are a couple of things. I don't know to what extent bears are visual, right? They, yeah, they... Um, yeah, it's more scent based, but they do have close interactions as well. And more closely related females have closer home ranges too, so they have these like matrilineal kind of like assemblages they're called where they live closer together so it's kind of like when you're studying them in one area you are studying closely related females especially so you know because similarity facial similarity right could be start suggesting hypotheses about kin recognition and things like that. But at the very least, there are some Mendelian traits that are there. And so the question, the scientific question is why? And that's, you know, let's talk because we have uh, five different uh, groups uh, of biologists who are interested in specifically that question of uh, the relationship between kin recognition and, uh, and, and some, you know, morphological traits and, uh, and and uh, and their similarity. So yes, please. The okay. other part is um, if you. So there are two ants, two two routes to to kind of deal with that. One is if you have. So is yours an open world problem? Um, well, no. At the moment, it's just closed set. But then we're trying with the camera trap data to make it open set. But we haven't really. You know, so if it's you know, if it's a yeah. closed set, meaning that you can actually train, right? You're using uh, deep neural networks for recognition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the so, images that we used for for the for that part were just handheld photos, like personal photos. Right. So but if more you're using, smaller... yeah. So if you're using anything that that's uh, uh, that's deep learning based for individual ID then use the triplet loss architecture for this because right. then it allows you to, to, to actually do this. You know, these two are the same, this is not. And you can force the distance uh, by showing it. Uh... Oh, okay. Um, so, right, so, so 
uh, Jason can add more, but it looks like you are using triplet loss. And so then with triplet loss, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we haven't yet, but yeah, that's what we're using. Right. Uh, so, so, so then in, in training by, you, you know, showing it the related individuals as the, as the third, as the, the, the other will force the distance, right? It will force it to recognize. Um, and then just following up a little bit on that, I thought your question about, I mean, yes, you can, you can use that information during training to do exactly what Tanya is suggesting, which is find more difficult negative pairs. Mm -hmm. So you have like this positive, two positives, one negative with triplet loss. And the most informative things are when that is the positive and negative is the hardest possible thing for the model to do, right? Because then that's mm -hmm. teaching it the most about how to separate these things that are challenging. Um, but also, we've been looking separately um, uh, at ways to, after you have visual re-identification, um, so now you have like for any given image, sort of this ranked list of scores into your existing database, how do you then take information about the social structure of the community into account to re-rank the likelihood? And for us, that's been um, because these are often very social animals that appear in groups. And so when humans actually make these decisions, they are highly dependent on recognizing like mm -hmm. the easiest to identify individuals and then using that as like a contextual prior over who the other individuals in the group are likely to be. So we've been exploring, trying to do that. And I could imagine that we could think about a way to think about that in the context of this sort of social hierarchies of your, of your actual community of bears, though with bears, you don't often see them together, right? They're solitary. So it's a slightly different framing of the problem, but there might be some similar thing that you could do to try to incorporate that like genetic structure um, as like a, an additional past over yeah. okay. the process. But, but really, you know, you can start asking questions about dispersal patterns, right? And because you can use face for, for the proxy. Um, uh, for proxy of genetic similarity. So really can go from genotype to phenotype. And uh, this is like awesome. We, as I said, we've been trying to do it for several species. Oh, great. Okay, well, everyone, let's thank Tanya again. Thank you, guys. Hi, Tanya. Awesome. So let's take a really quick break.